Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the fifth installment of our QCDR webinar series. Today's title, today's topic will be focused on execution tips for successful QCDR reporting. We hope that by this time you ha would have decided whether or not you will do registry reporting, and if so, that you would have decided to use the ACR's National Radiology Data Registries. Your presenters for today are myself, Alicia Blakey, Priya Sharma, and Corey Leiden. We thought it was very important that by the middle of this webinar series that we be sure to provide the perspective of an actual user who um, has some tips and strategies that she would like to share so that um, everyone can get a better sense of operationally how this, how this project is meant to continue. Today's webinar is being recorded Presentation slides and the webinar recording will be available on the QCDR webpage, as well as an email will be sent to all attendees today. One note of housekeeping, if you are interested in um, engaging with us throughout today's presentation, please submit your questions and answers, use your questions, sorry, to the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen. So what we will cover today is an overview of the QCDR process, timeline and key dates. Um, we also will spend some time looking at key features and navigation of our NRDR and MIPS portals. Mecklenburg Radiology Associates, they, do, they will share their experience, their QCDR user experience, and then we'll have some key considerations for using a QCDR if you're still deciding if it's the right reporting option for you. So this slide, um, essentially, ACR has, be, has been approved by CMS to be a qualified clinical data registry. We received this approval in May of 2017. Um, and then in essence, we also, during this approval process, CMS allows ACR to develop our own clinical quality measures. They are coined non-MIPS measures. These were approved in June of this year. The non-MIPS measures that I do um, emphasize are available through one of six clinical data registries that live under the National Radiology Data Registry umbrella. So we have six data registries and each of them have quality measures that are approved in, as for inclusion um, to satisfy MIPS participation. So just a quick reminder of some housekeeping of what a qualified clinical data registry is. As I mentioned, we've been approved by CMS for 2017 reporting. Some key benefits of using the QCDR reporting option is that we will support both individual physicians and physician group practices in meeting the MIPS requirements. It is important to know that MIPS does replace the PQRS program, and under the MIPS, there are four performance categories, quality, improvement activities, cost, and advancing care information. The QCDR has the capability to help you meet three out of the four performance categories. I would say that quality and improvement activities, if you are a radiology group and are considered non-patient facing, quality and improvement activities will be the primary focus for you for 2017. We'll manage submission of your MIPS and non-MIPS measures data to CMS. It's very important that we are a qualified clinical data registry. We are, um, there, we are not the only registry option. The other type is a qualified registry. The primary difference is the types of measures that you would report. If you are using a QCDR, you would report either MIPS or non-MIPS measures or a combination of both if you have the capability. If you are in a qualified registry, they will only report your MIPS quality measures, and of course, they will help you meet all of the other performance categories. We'll provide direct assistance with compiling the needed data for quality improvement. We are, um, our, we are a quality improvement registry, so we do give you real-time feedback after you submit data to our system. We provide this feedback at least quarterly. 
And then lastly, we allow physicians, your administrators, to review and select measures and, activ and improvement activities to report prior to the CMS submission deadline. We'll be going through deadlines in subsequent slides. So just a little bit on why you would be using the QCR for MIPS participation. In essence, radiologists, um, as well as physician group practices, will be able to avoid a negative 4 percentage payment adjustment that will be applied to your 2019 payment. So essentially, the only way to really get uh, a rejection or a negative payment adjustment is by not participating in MIPS in any way. To satisfy MIPS reporting requirements, clinicians and groups can use the QCDR to report three out of the four MIPS categories. We've already covered that. And then I wanted to just mention that we do, the group practice reporting option is still available. Um, and if you want to register to report as a group, you would do so using our NRDR portal. Um, you are not in any way required to uh, register with CMS. Um, in 2016, you were required to let CMS know of your group reporting status. You, that um, administrative burden has been, re has been removed for 2017. Essentially, if you do decide to do group reporting, CMS will assess all of your group's performance by your text ID number and apply one payment adjustment. Lastly, prior to submission of performance data by NRDR to QCDR, um, by the NRDR QCDR to CMS, physicians and group practices can select, confirm, and attest to the accuracy and completeness of data. This is one of the primary reasons why we uh, do have subsequent deadlines that we want you to be aware of, because throughout the QCDR phase, you will not be attesting to measures. Right now, I have a lot of people inquiring about how to attest to measures. We will not be doing that at this time, this early in the in the phase one, because we don't have a complete full year of your data submitted to the registry. So the MIPS QCDR timeline, this is a high, li high level timeline that we do post on our website. I would say that this is, I would say January 31st is when all data needs to be submitted to CMS. And then you'll see the next date of March 1, 2018 for report for um, making sure you pay your MIPS reporting fees. That is the deadline. We, of course, accept payment before March 1st. Um, so if you do get an invoice, we will accept that payment earlier. But the deadlines on this website is meant to be the worst case scenario. So um, if it's January 30th, we would ask that you would have um, submitted most of your MIPS quality uh, measures data to us. There are a lot of deadlines that are missing from this, this short snapshot, but you can refer to our QCDR participation checklist for additional deadlines. The primary deadline of interest to anyone on the call today is that if you do want to use the ACR's QCDR option for MIPS participation, we ask that you let us know this by October 31st. That means when we get to November 1st, we would have to turn some groups away who are not already registered in our NRDR system. And then primarily, because we're coming up on the end of the reporting period of December 31st, we ask that you do have some data submitted for each of the registries that you plan to use. The, the last deadline on this timeline is that March 31st is the last day that ACR, as well as other QCDR vendors, have to submit your data to CMS. So by any means, we are not collecting additional data in March. Um, the March, I would say February and March is the time frame where you will select your measures, your improvement activities, and complete your attestation. So on this slide is just a quick snapshot of what resources and um, tools that we have available to help educate you about the Qualified Clinical Data Registry and MIPS reporting. On this website, you will find all educational material related to the quality measures, the improvement activities, how to get started, as well as the QCDR participation checklist. Please reference this website to answer some of your basic questions, especially if you're new to 
the QCDR process. So I think graphically it's important to outline what what is it that you need to do to participate in the QCDR to maximize your participation. I've outlined it into a five-step process. Of course, there are several things that can happen in between these steps, but these are the high levels. So step one, um, I get a lot of calls and say, okay, I heard about this QCDR thing. How? What do I do now? Well, we need to know step one is looking at our available measures that are included in our registry and then decide based on those quality measures which of our six clinical data registries are you interested in participating in. We want you to select a registry that are appropriate to the services that your radiologist provides. So if, if you want to sign up for the National Mammography Data Registry, that would be good if you have um, people who do mammography, but if you do not, you are not in any way required to submit data to that registry. Step two, after you select your registry, you know which measures you want to report, we ask that you tell us who your physicians are. Step three, because this is a CMS quality program, all of your information will be assessed using your doctor's MPI and your tax ID information. We ask that you do include this information in our NRDR and we will also ask you to update it, especially if you are participating in QCDR for multiple years. This is also the location where you would indicate whether or not you are interested in doing the group reporting option. It's important that you select this um, if this is what you plan to do. Step four, after we've gotten the administrative test out of the way, you would actually start submitting your measured data for the performance year. We have two types of measures, MIPS and non-MIPS measures. And because we have six different data registries, understanding those data submission requirements are critical to your success in the QCDR process. Lastly, step five, we are a qualified improvement registry. Yes, we wanna help you with reporting, but that is not our primary goal. We want you to monitor your performance overall and make use of your feedback reports in the MIPS portal. Um, these resources are at your disposal. So as I mentioned, we have a number of quality measures that can be reported. They've been approved by CMS for inclusion in our QCDR. We have six data registries. Each of these data registries has a, anywhere from two to six quality measures that can be used for MIPS reporting. A question that I get is that, um, do you need to do all of them? Absolutely not. Your goal, your goal, what you're trying to achieve for 2017 reporting is six quality measures. So you can do a combination of any, any of the registries that are available. And then you'll see that we do have MIPS quality measures. They are your traditional PQRS measures that have been in the program since 26, I mean, since 2007. There are 50 plus measures. So we're looking at anywhere from um, 70 to 80 quality measures that you could possibly report uh, to, to meet the MIPS quality performance category, definitely. So this is just an example of a resource we have on the website that outlines all of the MIPS quality measures, their reporting instructions, as well as um, any measures that are identified as high priority. CMS does for the quality performance category, we, they do provide emphasis that you must report an outcomes measure. And if an outcomes measure is not available, you can report a high priority measure. So if you do not have an outcome measure, just try to report a high priority. They're indicated on our measures list with the apostrophe. And then here's an example because some some provide some sites or groups may not be aware that we have the non MIPS measures list. We tell you what those measures are, as well as their high priority status, and as well as which data registry they belong to. So if you are interested in CT colonography, we would ask that you register for the CT colonography registry. Um, also include MIPS participation on your registration, and then go ahead and start submitting the necessary data. As you will see, these measures are not CPT driven heavily, heavily like the MIPS measures. They are based on um, important data elements like exam dates for the time that a final report was signed 
for a turnaround time measure. So keep that in mind. Because we have so many quality measures, we did create an interactive tool called the MIPS Measure Calculator. Uh, we did a, a demo on a prior webinar, so we won't do that again. But I also wanted to emphasize this tool is more than just a calculator. It does outline all of the requirements for MIPS participation, as well as some information on APMs. And we do want you to make use of this tool. So if you have any questions about what MIPS is or what it is that you're required to do, we ask that you use this calculator. On the calculator, as I mentioned, it's meant to help you decide which quality measure you're interested in reporting. We do have an interactive tool that tells you all of the requirements, and we allow you to um, filter the available quality measures by your specialty area, by your modality, and by registry. So please do use that tool, and if you have any feedback, send it over to staff. Um, next is our QCDR participation checklist. For anyone that is new to using the QCDR, it could be a little hard and overwhelming to uh, look through all of those documents and web links on our website. So we do have a QCDR participation checklist. It's actually a, a two-page document. If you could download that, it'll have all, everything that you need to do from registration to participation agreements. Um, as well as data submission and attestation and some key deadlines and timelines. So I do ask that you make use of the QCDR participation checklist. It will answer most of your questions if you have quality meetings, if you need to talk with your radiologist in any way about this process. I would say that this is a handy document to carry to a meeting. So I think that sums up the overview of the QCDR process, the measures that are available, and some interactive tools that you can use to make the decision of how you're going to participate in the QCDR. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Priya Sharma, who uh, most of you may be aware of her name because she handles a lot of our registration and account setup. So I'll turn it over to her. So to start the new registration, anybody that's interested in using NRDR for QCDR, you would complete a new facility registration for each of your locations. If you are just using NRDR for MIPS, you would only have to register one facility. You wouldn't have to register every location that your facility participates at. Um, if you're a child site, it would be the specific locations that you're facilities or your radiologists are performing at. The master site is just a corporate account that we use for billing purposes and for MIPS purposes. Your physicians would be registered at your master facility. If you are not sure if your facility is already in the registry, you can always submit a ticket to nrdrsupport.acr.org and we can research your locations to see if you might already be participating in NRDR. Uh, would have to add, if you're already existing, you would have to add MIPS to all of your locations and you can do so by clicking registration. When you log in, only a facility administrator will be able to add MIPS. If you don't see MIPS in your list of registries, you will need to register for MIPS. If you see that MIPS is there and we have not yet accepted your registration, you see a no there, we would need a signed agreement or addendum to accept your registration. If you're a child site and you know that your facility has already submitted an agreement for your master location, just send us an email so that we can accept all of your child sites. Uh, so we would need a signed participation agreement MBAA or an addendum to accept your MIPS registration. And if you're new to NRDR, we do have registry fees that are only available at the master facility. Child facilities should not receive an invoice, and if you do, please let us know so that we can research that because you would not be linked to the master if you do receive an invoice at your child site. The registration fee is a one-time NRDR registration fee of $500 that's due when you sign up. And then we have annual fees based on the number of locations and radiologists. If you participate in DIR or GRID, the rest of the registries are included in that cost. For MIPS, we do have different reporting fees, and those are based on physicians. It's also based on the facility. The physicians are first added. 
For ACR members, for 2017 reporting, it's $199, and non-members is $1,299, which is due March 1st, 2018. So a lot of confusion comes in now when what do you do if your hospitals are already participating in NRDR? So there's two paths for the radiology group to choose from. If your hospitals give you permission, you can join their registration. They would have to add you, someone from your group, as registry administrators and make sure that you have MIPS access. You would add your TIN and physician and enroll them in MIPS from the master site, and you would upload your MIPS files to the master. You would not incur additional registry fees because the hospital would already be invoiced. If you do not want to join the hospitals group to add your enroll your physicians, or if they don't give you permission, you would have to enroll your physicians in MIPS by registering your own facility. You'd have to make sure you add your physician group 10. You would also have to make sure that your physicians and TINs are added to the hospitals, the locations that are already in the system, and you would upload your MIPS file to your facility. If you are only enrolling in MIPS, you wouldn't incur an additional facility fee, but you would have your physician fees. And also, if you're uncertain as to whether the hospitals are already in the system, be sure to submit a ticket so that we can re register, research that. Uh, once your physicians are registered, you would, are, you would have to register your physicians in Manage Physicians. I always recommend that you use the physician template but you would have to enroll your physicians in MIPS, which you can do from the spreadsheet or manually. You would have to add your physicians to all facilities, master and child. They would be given a login where you would only receive one login and it would be used to submit all of their data. And they must register in the portal. So that means your physicians would have to log in and register into the system. If you do have a large number of physicians, you would have to submit a ticket, let us know, so that that can be done from the back end. And this is just a way to show how to add your physicians. So you would go to Manage Physicians. You'll see the template that's up at the very top to click on that link to get that. I highly stress using the physician's template upload because you can add multiple physicians at a time. You can enroll them in multiple registries at once and you'll know right away whether your physicians were loaded into the system or not. And then you will also have to add your physician group 10, and you do that by going to the Manage Physician Group 10 page. If you have a master site, I recommend adding it at the master facility because you will see a list of all your child sites at this location. You would have to put in a date available to from date for your TIN, you do not have to put an end date in there. You also have to upload a document that confirms that this is your group TIN and that it's active and valid. Different forms of proof are a submitted claim, a tax document, or other TIN official paperwork. When you're adding your TIN, you can also show that you are a G Pro by checking off that G Pro box and you would check off which registries you want this TIN to be for. And if you bill for Medicare for more than one TIN, we can accept all TINs. Just make sure to let us know what registry that TIN goes with. And here's just a shot of the physician group TIN page where it shows where you would add your TIN, check off the G Pro. You'll see the facility with the drop down where you can check off all the facilities that you want this TIN to go to. You have the registry drop down where you can check off the registries that you want to participate in for this TIN, and then you must put in the date available from. Thanks, Priya. So as we mentioned, when we um, prior, we talked about it's very important to make sure that your registration is complete and that you have indicated to ACR that you do want to participate for MIPS purposes. So it's very important we talked about how to add your physicians and how to add your text ID number. These two numbers are critical so that we may assign MIPS and non-MIPS quality measures to your group. If we do not have both a 10 and an MPI, we will be unable to attribute any measure data to your physician. You have the ability to view all available measures for your group in the MIPS participation portal. 
Um, this is a common question of how do I get to the actual portal? Log into NRDR on the left hand side of your screen. Log in with your credentials, facility administrator, physician user, whichever your um, user role type is. You want to select on your left hand side, you want to select MIPS measure participation. From there, you will be required to select data collection and reports, and you'll see some key dates and deadlines um, as, a, as a gentle reminder. After you click on data collection and reports, you will be taken to the MIPS participation portal. On that portal, you will see a number of tabs. Primarily, the, 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 tab, the tab that I'm showing on this screen is to upload your data. That means we would need you to upload all MIPS data files using approved templates that are displayed here on your screen. Um, the MIPS portal is, is, that's how you access the portal and that's some of the features. So how to submit your data? QCR participants can submit data for both MIPS and non-MIPS measures. We will also, in the portal, collect attestation uh, for your improvement activities and any advanced and care information measure data if that is required for your group to participate in that category. ACR, we collect quality data um, in a number of following ways. It could be a manual web-based entry, flat file or Excel file upload. We do have web services API. We have an automated, uh, automation um, system for the dose index registry. It does make use of triad software, which would feed data to us on an annual basis on a daily basis, sorry. And then the fifth option is, is newer. It's for our interventional radiology registry only. We have the capability to use HL7 messaging, transmission, and use of structured report templates that have been designed by ACR and the Society for Interventional Radiologists. It is important to note that if you are submitting data for MIPS or non-MIPS quality measures, that there are different um, data submission options available to you. So, if, and especially if you participate in more than one registry, it will collect data differently. We do have uh, on our QCR webpage under the toolkit, we do have an NRDR data submission table so that you can reference that um, after this webinar. This is an example of what the data submission table looks like. You will have by registry all of the different data submission mechanisms, as well as uh, required documents, Excel templates, and um, data dictionaries so that you can know how to populate your files correctly. So I think it's important because we have so many different data registries, it's important to understand some of the specific tips for each of the registries. So for the dose index registry, as I mentioned, it does rely on triad software. Um, so it does need to be set up properly. And then someone at your facility will need to map all of your exams so that they, um, so that, that data, that information gets included in your feedback report. So if you're looking at your dose index registry report and you do not see any data, there may be something wrong with the software or there may be an issue with the exam name mapping. So please be aware of that. Very important, for 2017, we now have three new quality measures for the dose index registry. In prior years, for 2016, we had six quality measures. So um, they were AC reds 9 through 15 through 14, those quality measures are no longer reportable. You must report ACRAD 31, 32, and 33. Those measures are available for you if you're in the dose index registry. For GRID, it's very important that you submit exam level data for MIPS participation. Um, the, and I say that because if your hospital has been participating in the grade registry and primarily not for MIPS purposes, they may have been submitting facility level data and that unfortunately we're unable to assign or calculate the quality measures with uh, facility level data. So please be sure that you provide exam level data. And there are a few changes for the measures. There are some new measures for the grade registry. There's still six quality measures that are available. AC RAD 15 through 19, and we now have AC RAD 25 that calculates 
turnaround time for mammography. So please be aware of the um, non-MIPS measures list for 2017. There are some changes. For the LCSR and NMD registry, we do require two years worth of data. You will need to give us information on the screening exam as well as 12 month follow-up. So if you do not have the 12 month follow-up data, you will be unable to use the non-MIPS quality measures for MIPS participation. So keep that in mind. The interventional radiology is our newest registry. It has MIPS and non-MIPS measures that can be uh, reported through that registry option. And we would do that via either data file upload or HL7 messaging and structure report template. CTC, um, one, the last of our six clinical data registries, this is the only registry right now that requires man manual data entry, so you are unable to upload um, exam information for this particular registry. And if you do participate, you would get credit for ACRAD 1 and ACRAD 2. QCDR reporters should be sure, just as a gentle reminder, that all 10 in MPI information are updated on all accounts just to reinforce what Priya mentioned earlier. So we discussed the MIPS portal. <coughs> Our participants can access the MIPS portal at any time. Um, I would emphasize that portal registration is re required for your physicians, and this will impact their data upload process. So if you can make sure your physicians have completed that registration for the portal, it'll help you later when you're trying to upload your MIPS data files. Some of the key features of the portal is that it provides a location for your MIPS measures. You can review um, all quality measures and performance scores for MIPS and non-MIPS measures in this, in this field. And then you are allowed in the portal to select measures and complete attestation prior to CM estimates. We do, in this portal, we provide physician and group level performance data for all physicians across multiple locations and TENS. So if you have done your, your work during the registration process of adding your TIN and your MPI to multiple sites, all measures will appear in your portal. That's MIPS measures and non-MIPS measures. Even if you don't intend to report all of the measures, they will appear. This is an example of the MIPS participation portal. On the home screen, you'll see information about the requirements as well as the measures that are reportable. And this is an example, I get this question all the time, show me my performance. Unfortunately, we're unable to show you performance if you do not have the quality data. This is an example of the uh, types of information that will be displayed for you if you do upload files or you do meet the data submission requirements for any one of the six registries. Information on the patient's population, your performance rate, as well as your reporting rate. So it's important these percents are very key to make sure that you select measures for CMS submission, you want to select the ones with the highest performance. Um, and in any measures that have low performance, we want you to monitor this portal throughout so that you can make adjustments as necessary. This display is showing PQRS-related measures. And then we also, in this portal, um, we will display any non-MIPS non uh, I think I said Pika, sorry about that. <laughs> Any non-MIPS measures we will display in the portal for you. So this is the level of detail that you would get. So now I want to make sure we have enough time. Uh, we've wrapped up all of the operational things that have to happen so that your QCR experience is, is good and you can maximize your participation. Um, it's great to hear from ACR staff, but we thought it would be even better to um, have a site participate and just participate in today's web conference, give you their experience. Corey Leiden is on the line from um, Mecklenburg Radiology Associates. She is the former billing director. And now what has taken over her, her life is reporting and analysis for the MIPS program. So as you can see, roles change um, now that this MIPS participation is, is here. Sites just need someone who manages it. Um, so Corey can share her experience. Her overall QCDR profile is that they're participating with three facilities right now, a hospital, a large hospital system, um, a breast center, and their physician group, Mecklenburg Radiology Associates. They have about 60 or more um, physicians participating in the registry. 
This is their second year participating in the QCDR process. And then lastly, their registration participation. Uh, when we looked at all their facilities with our registration team, we see that they really do have access to DIR, LCSR, NMD, and MIPS quality measures. For their 2016 CMS submission, I'll let Corey um, share her experience because she took on this role from um, who's now Joe Barbie, their executive director. So it was kind of like, okay, what is this thing and how do I operate it? So she'll share her experience. For 2016 reporting, they only focus on MIPS quality measures, but the way that they're set up, they could essentially have their physicians um, report their non-MIPS measures because they're participating in multiple registries. So Corey, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so yes, Alicia is correct that last year, uh, 2016, we started using the uh, QCDR. Um, it was a lot of work to get it set up. I won't lie about that. But once it's set up, it rolls over from year to year. So it's easy. Once it's set up the first time, um, it, it's good to go from there. Um, we made the decision to switch from claims reporting to the QCDR for a number of reasons. Uh, one is, you know, there was a rumor that claims reporting will be phased out. Um, two, we wanted to report on all of our claims, not just our Medicare. Um, there's a much quicker feedback on the QCDR. We don't have to wait until the end of the following year to get a report back from uh, CMS. And uh, it's really been a very easy, uh, now that we know all about it, it's easy to navigate, it's easy to get in there, uh, get your reports, know where you stand, know where you need to make improvements, and um, it gives you the ability to do that throughout the year. You don't have to wait until the following year to find out if um, where you need to improve. So um, some of the stuff uh, with the with the registries with the hospital, um, we are set up to report. Uh, however, we're still working through that. Uh, we're working with the hospital to make sure that we're getting all of the reports that we need. We want to make sure that we're both on the same page from a provider and from the, the hospital side, that we're submitting all the information that is needed uh, so that when we do get these reports back, we know where we're at, we know what we're looking at, we know that our performance is good, um, and, and we plan on submitting for 2018. We're going to use this 2017 year as a uh, uh, a buffer year as a, a, where we're going to really sit with the hospitals and, and make sure all the information that we need is there so that we can keep using this for more and more measures. Um, submitting the MEPS uh, has been quite easy the upload on the uh, on the portal very easy um, we use it at monthly since since uh, since it started in May once uh, the portal was approved um, I've been submitting on a monthly basis so I know exactly where uh, my thresholds are, I know exactly what my performance is, and again, I can make any corrections that we need to make, um, give feedback to our providers, uh, who's performing well, who needs a, a, a little boost. Um, it, it's worked quite well. Um, Alicia can attest that when we first started with this, that we probably sent her over 100 emails or more. Um, the ACR has been very, very helpful. They're very responsive. The um, IT team has been very responsive. Uh, we've made suggestions. They are open to suggestions. If um, you, you would like to perhaps see something in a different way, they're very open to, um, to hear all of your feedback, which is really nice. Um, so that's helped tremendously. 
We we appreciate you sharing that experience, Corey. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, yeah, we we want people to know that this is a doable process. It it does require a little bit of work in the beginning, but overall, I think it's a it's a good system. And if you're willing to work with ACR to help us improve it, and even even better, you can go ahead and give us um, submit your suggestions or feedback to us via email, and we'll we'll take that into consideration as we um, make enhancements for future MIPS reporting years. And if you do have questions for Corey, uh, we'll we'll have some time for a question and answer session, but go ahead and submit them via chat, um, and we'll be sure to get those over to her for a response. Um, as Corey mentioned, and we've mentioned throughout this, this webinar series, is that it's very important that you do take a look at your feedback report. Essentially, we pr provide uh, registry comparisons. We give it to physicians, um, we provide facility level, sorry, and physician level data, at least quarterly. Um, the importance of reports is really important to check your performance scores for improvement and analyze data submission for complete accuracy. It's very important that if your feedback report has missing information or you are um, confused about benchmark data or anything, we do have a great statistician team here that could um, help you through interpreting those feedback reports. And we've also already spotlighted a webinar on feedback reports. We'll have another one um, before the end of this series. Just some important information. You do have a full um, feedback report or aggregate report for each of the data registries that you're in. Please log into your NRDR site and download those files. Part of those files, there is a separate uh, report that is available. It's called your QCDR preview report, and the schedule is in front of you. So if you are participating for the first time or you just start now getting started, we Q2 reports will be coming out in a few weeks. And then so if you are new to the QCDR, you will go ahead and give us data for Q1 through Q3. Um, we ask that you give us the data by September for a report that would be issued in November. So we are coming up on the end of this reporting cycle for MIPS. Um, and then Q4 reports will be issued in February. That's why I say February and March is a real important time where you actually have a full year's worth of data, you're viewing um, your performance rates, your reporting rates, and you're selecting measures at that time so that we can wrap up everything early March of 2018. Key considerations for using the QCDR, facility and registry administrators, they are the gatekeepers, holders that manage all of your MIPS participation. Be sure your registry account indicates MIPS. We do have um, a quite a lot more, a majority of facilities have been participating in the NRDR registries for several years and may not be doing the CMS quality reporting. So if you do, if you would like to do that, go ahead and add that to your account. We ask that you do that by October. We, have, uh, we also think, please, and emphasize that we want you to review both of our measures lists, our MIPS measures and our non-MIPS measures, so that you are aware of the measures that are available to you, the data submission requirements, especially because they vary by registry. We want you to submit your data frequently to enhance any of your feedback reports as well as data that will be in the MIPS portal. So the MIPS portal is kind of the central place where you would view your performance rates for MIPS and non-MIPS measures, so please do navigate that site. Um, and if you don't see information, um, it may be something with wrong with the, how the data was submitted to us or maybe you hadn't start, started that process. I would say do not wait to submit your data at the end of the year. It will be very hard to make any changes. Websites and resources, this is the fifth of our QCDR webinar series. So we have a website dedicated to all of the past recordings and slides, as well as registering for upcoming announcements. Um, we do have a lot of resources on our QCDR website, so I pulled out just a few to get you started. Details on our non-MIPS measures, our measures list, the QCDR participation checklist, I cannot stress that more too much. 
Um, and then we do have a new NRDR help desk where you can submit a ticket electronically or email us. So go ahead and take advantage of that. Part of this, uh, part of most of this talk has been dedicated to the MIPS quality measures and non-MIPS measures. But we do want you to be looking at the list of improvement activities we have on our website. Be thinking of what, which activities you want to attest to by the end of the year. You can pick anywhere from one to four activities, so keep that in mind. This is just a list of our upcoming webinars. We hope that you do plan to join us next month, September 21st. Uh, we'll uh, title it Avoiding Costly Errors. In October is also a big time here at ACR. We have our annual quality and safety conference where we actually get a chance to be in front of a lot of our radiologists, business managers, residents, fellows. It's a day and a half conference focused on all aspects of quality as well as quality improvement tools. So do take advantage of that. Registration is still open. Um, and you can actually still get the early bird discount until about next week. So do take advantage of that. And I think that's it. If you need to contact us in any way, you can submit a ticket to our new help desk. You can email us or you can reach us via phone. The staff is here in the room. They've been typing furiously, answering your questions that have been submitted via chat. If there are, in, are there any outstanding questions or anything that I can summarize or, or add to the discussion in any way? There was a question um, or someone would like us to speak about measures that don't have benchmarks yet um, or available. Uh, that's a good question. There's a number of those in the uh, ACR's QCDR, both MIPS and non-MIPS. And what CMS has said in the last year's final rule, and they have clarified that somewhat in this year's proposed rule, is that when feasible, they will develop performance period or same year uh, benchmarks. So those benchmarks wouldn't be available until the close of the performance period, which isn't a tremendous solution because you don't know what um, really what you're measured against. But um, and they so CMS will develop benchmarks where the measure has been reported um, by at least um, 20, 20 individuals or groups and um, the data for that, those that have reported, meets the reporting requirements. There's something else. And um, so what we are doing for the um, QCDR measures is developing the internal registry benchmarks for as data comes in through the year and we will keep updating those so by the end of the year you would have some sense of what the benchmark would be uh, for those measures without them. You can choose to report those measures and um, potentially they may be CMS may score them so you could get more than the baseline three points but um, it depends on how many people report it. So we are always encouraging people to report it. And if it's not one that's used in your um, scoring, you could potentially get bonus points for it. So it doesn't hurt to submit additional measures. Yes, and I, and I would just add, so the goal is to report six quality measures. And then each of those quality measures can earn anywhere from three to 10 uh, point based on the benchmark data. So keep that in mind. The top question is um, always, okay, I want to I want to report more than six because I want to try to get some bonus points. As Judy mentioned, there are bonus points um, if you report a any outcome measure over one outcome measure. And then if you don't have outcome measures, try to they carry high weight the high priority areas to give you more points more bonus points also. So keep that in mind. Uh, we do have some questions here. So I'll start off with this one from Anson. Uh, Anson asks, can you provide the slides or step-by-step -step instructions for MIPS upload? Where can we, where can we direct them for a step-by-step? -step? 
Or is uh, he talking about the slides? The, the step by step for the MIPS upload. For, for uploading MIPS file. data. Oh. So the MIPS data files are available on our QCDR web page under the section How to Submit Data. We will give you, we actually give you three files. It's, we have the Excel template or the text file template. We'll give you the specifications on how you should format that file and how you should name the file. And then we also give you sort of a cheat sheet of all the 2017 codes related to the MIPS quality measures. So using those three documents would help you upload your MIPS data to the portal. Um, you can do that on your own time. And then as you upload the MIPS data files, we'll give you feedback within 24 to 48 hours if there are records that are rejected, if details are missing, inaccurate, we give you real-time feedback. So the more you upload, the, the better feedback we can give you on the file format. In the file format files, everything is on our QCR webpage. And then lastly, I would just emphasize that your physicians do have to be registered in the portal before you can upload any NIST file. Uh, I've got a couple questions here from Carrie. Uh, Carrie is asking, how often is the MIPS performance tab updated? And if I've been submitting data all year long to the DIR, shouldn't those measures show up on my MIPS performance report tab? Well, the, um, we are currently calculating the DIR measure, the new DIR measures. This is one reason why you don't see them yet. Um, because we had to wait until they were actually approved by CMS, which was late May. So we're currently using the um, um, DIR quarter two report to calculate the new, the three new DIR measures, and they should be available within the next few weeks. Thanks. Uh, we got a question here from Ann. And says, we are an imaging facility that has five different hospitals that our radiologists read for. Do we add the hospitals as separate child facility IDs or add them under the master? And will that be a charge to add them all? So if you have the five hospitals, if they are already participating in the registry, you would be able to add them to your registration. You would be able to hop onto their site. But if they are not in the system, you would only have to register those hospitals if you want to submit non-MIPS measures. So if you're only using the MIPS measures, you would only have to have one facility registration where you would enroll your physicians, upload your TIN, upload your MIPS file upload. But if you are using the non-MIPS measures, you would incur registry fees. And that's dependent on the number of locations and the number of physicians. Uh, we've got a Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we've got a question here from Sherry. Um, Sherry asks, if you create your own facility but want to report both MIPS and non-MIPS measures, what are some of the additional fees that can be incurred? So some of the other fees, you, if you are using some of the other registries, you would have the one-time NRDR registration fee of $500. And then you would have registry fees. If you participate in DIR or GRID, you're you receive all of the other registries included in that cost. Uh, and again, that is a sliding scale, so it would vary based on your bracket and how many number of facilities and how many positions you have. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here from Veronica. Veronica asks, uh, say I submit more than one record in the Excel file, but one of them is rejected. How do I know which one is the record that got rejected? We actually allow... Um, Okay. Go ahead, we'll let our IT take that. So if the files got rejected, they will appear in the log file. So uh, you go to the portal where you upload the file, go to the far right where you see a little icon and you can click on it to expand to see the download log file. Um, the rejected record should be in the log file and, and you scroll all the way to the right, it will give you an error message why the re record was rejected. Can I make a suggestion with a sorry. failed file? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm sorry. Oh, well, um, one of the difficult things that I have found that if something in a file has failed and, you know, you're able to go in and um, review it and make any corrections that you need to, um, but when you when you upload it again, 
it creates a new file name. So last year in 2016, <clears throat> I was learning this whole process and try to figure out how to get all of this together. Um, I've created hundreds of files. And because I created so many, it's kind of hard to um, connect all of them together that, you know, I've, I've corrected this file and it's now named something different. Um, is there a way that you can connect them in such a way that they keep a file name so that you could keep all of your information together? So, you know, I, I, I submitted a number of measures last year and it got a little overwhelming when now I have over 100 files in there trying to remember what, which one did I correct? Um, did I resubmit? Yeah, thanks for your suggestion, uh, Corey. Uh, we'll look into it and we'll discuss with our development team and see if we can come up with a solution. Okay, thanks. Would yeah. you correct, oh, sorry. Would you correct, Corey, because you're a G Pro, your file name it changes to like I believe it includes like your text ID number yeah. and the and then it's date and time stamp. So that's the only way to track it currently, but we can look into changing oh, yeah. that. Yeah, just just try to connect them in some way so you know which one um you did correct and resubmit. That's all. That okay. Oh yeah, that's all yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And after this webinar is over, we're having our weekly QCDR team meeting, so we'll talk about that. <laughs> and uh, okay. that, it looks like that's it for the questions. So um, we can go ahead and wrap up. Just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to engage in today's webinar. We hope that you found it meaningful. We'll give you the recording as well as the slide presentation for anyone that attended today. Please share it with your colleagues if they missed today's call. And a special thank you to Priya Sharma and Corey from Mecklenburg for helping me share all of this uh, great, intense information with you. So, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.